Hello everybody, I'm Steven Yahoko with California Skate Parks out of the Sonoma Mendocino Coast District. And today I am coming to you live from Hendy Woods State Park. Um, beautiful park uh, that's designated as a very great place to explore some um, very amazing habitats and ecosystems. But today we're going to be exploring um, some plant communities and you might hear this word plant communities from time to time um, and it's really describing um, what type of ecosystem and plant communities tie all sorts of living organisms together in an ecosystem all dependent on what plants are dominant in that area so we're going to be exploring now on um, just want to make sure that everybody who is coming out to visit on state parks at this point, um, keep your, uh, you know, you have to have a face cover with you, um, you know, if you're uh, recreating around anybody at all, please make sure you have your face cover ready to pull up over your face. Um, as well, we are still maintaining six foot distance, making sure that we are washing up good, uh, 20 seconds washing your hands, and um, no congregating in groups. Um, now, just remember that your actions save lives. Right, well, we are going to be exploring plant communities. Um, and plant communities, again, are places that are designated as to the dominant plants in an area. Now, these can consist of anything from redwood forests to oak woodlands to mixed conifer forests. Um, to oak woodlands, um, to, let's see, riparian zones. And we're going to take a walk through a couple different ones uh, today, and I'm going to show you around. So right now I'm in um, Hendy Woods State Park. Of course, we are in the campground right now. And this consists of a lot of different types of trees, our tan oaks, some redwoods, as well as some um, Douglas fir trees. And this is what we consider a mixed conifer forest. And as we go down, I want to uh, take a look at a couple things. Now, plant communities can designate what type of living organisms you might find. And it all depends on the conditions of the soil the amount of sunlight, some of the conditions of the availability of water. And, uh, you know, if you're ever wondering what plant community you're in, you can take a look down at some of the soil. And we can take a look down here and see that a lot of what we're seeing here, well, we can see what trees are around just by picking apart the understory some of the soil composition is going to be made up of all the leaves and all the things that fall on the ground and what we have here well we got tan oak around we have some redwood needles um i see here we have in our area some these are uh pine these are um pollen bearing cones for a pine tree some might find some sticks and debris. Um, we also have in this area lots of drone and some other trees that may not be shedding their leaves at this point. But this is a plant community that we consider a mixed conifer forest, meaning it's got a little bit of everything. Now, if you take a look around, the ones that are thriving, this is a campground, so it is quite disturbed. But let's move on and see what we find as we move down into different conditions, different availability of sun. And uh, you'll notice that the plants around us are changing. See, we got tan oak. Right here, we got some huckleberry. The evergreen huckleberry, very common in our coast. Now, let's continue down and see what else we can find. Sorry about the shakiness of the camera. I'm moving down the trail down into, uh, this is called the Eagle Trail. 
And I'm sorry, the spot, the uh, reception might not be perfect. Typically, like to do uh, any sort of live feeds with a little bit more service than I got right now. But I hope it's coming through all right. If uh, you are hearing me and seeing me all right, give me a thumbs up. Say hi if you want to. Um, always great to see people jumping on. Okay, so I'm moving down this slope, and slopes can be um, pretty. Um, you know, can be a conditional thing because it doesn't act as a basin for water to collect. Though we might find channels as water moves through an area. This is a what we call a um, watershed, right? And a watershed is anywhere where water might continue to move um, from one area to another. Now it hasn't rained in a while. But we are still in that mixed conifer forest, though we find a difference in the plants under because of the way that water is shedding. We have um, some modesty down here. We have a couple of grasses and sedges um, coming through. But we did notice that the uh, plants have changed entirely now because all the water is moving through this area and these plants that we're seeing around us is used to water moving by and it can grab it quickly as it passes. Also another cool uh, shrub that we have in the Penny Woods. This here is um, the California hazel that actually does uh, make uh, hazelnuts that are edible if you cook them right. But you gotta beat the squirrels to them. Now, along with the plants that might be dependent on a community, the plant community, you also find animals that are dependent on those uh, plants and the fruits that might be available, right? So you're only gonna find, um, say, squirrels and rodents around uh, trees that might find uh, nuts and, uh, and all sorts of things that they can eat, right? And the thing is, if you're trying to find a hazelnut on a hazel tree, you got to beat the squirrels to them because they got nothing else to do but watch these things grow. So I don't see any actual forming hazels on this uh, tree right now. But if you ever see one of these plants around, kind of serrated leaves, um, the leaves are very velvety. And it doesn't get to be a very big tree. Um, but of course, Make sure that you're not reaching out for poison oak because I can see sometimes this might be confused with poison oak, but not so much. It's got hairy leaves and these serrations are sharp. If it were bumpy and smooth, you uh, might want to watch out for poison oak, right? Cool. So we're moving through. This is uh, called, right now, we're moving through an uh, ecotome where we're transferring from one plant community to another right on the border and as we move in we're going to see a total change of habitat okay see that right ahead this is a grassland and of course the difference of the conditions here when we don't see a whole lot of trees around in this grassland this is a great spot to get ticks why you always stay on trail but we got on the edge of this forest, we got some live oak. And as we open up, we can find this grassland. And grassland is, this is an area that was disturbed deeply by um, human interaction. This is actually where the leach field for the campground is. So they had to plow a certain area and uh, put, uh, put in a leach field. That's why we're getting this grassland where it is. Um, now this is also a great place where you can find lots of uh, birds that are after lots of bugs. You might also find lizards <laughs> that are uh, dependent on the amount of sun that they need. So. Um, the wildlife changes as you go from one habitat to another. One plant community may support 
a different variety or biodiversity of animal life, right? That's kind of the point of this whole thing, but we're gonna continue on because there's more plant communities for us to explore. Uh, Is everybody having a beautiful day right now at uh, Hindywood State Park? We're looking about uh, 75 degrees. It's a little warmer than I like it to be, but it's not as hot as it could be. Of course, I'm moving through the trail. I gotta swing my tripod up a little bit so that it's not dragging in all the plants that are around because a lot of these plants are very important. Now, we just moved through a grassland, but we're going through another ecotome or transition from one forest to another. And down below, we may see some, um, this is black-capped raspberry, a family member of the blackberry family. Um, and we also have poison oak mixed up in there. If you're hiking around, know the plants and stay on the trail so you don't get poison oak. You don't regret uh, going on a beautiful hike, right? Poison oak. Leaves of three, leave it be. If it's shiny, watch your hiney. If it's hairy, it's a berry. <laughs> uh, good, easy way to remember. But poison oak can be green, red, all the colors in between. Oh, hi, Emily. <laughs> it's 80 to 80s and sticky here. Yeah, um, it's hot here, um, but it is not that humid today, which is great i mean of course i i melt in like anything over uh 90 so <laughs> that's why i love the mendocino coast um but yes so we have um poison oak over here it can be red at this time of year it can be green it can be red and green at any time of the year but typically if in the spring you might find it red um very small leaves um, it all depends on how uh, much sun it's getting, right? Now the grassland that we were just in, this is an area where you can uh, expect open sun and the plants that are around you um, are very well adapted to that. So as we move through, we're going into actually an oak woodland. And it's still kind of mixed conifer foresty. There are some conifers around. But what we're seeing is, well, California bay laurel, some live oak, um, tan oak. We still have some of those Douglas firs around. We're not seeing a whole lot of redwood at this spot. Um, but just give me like a hundred more feet down the trail and we'll be in a totally different ecosystem. That's what's so cool about this lesson is that I'm like, I will probably have traveled maybe 500 feet this whole talk and we'll, we will have explored a number of different habitats. So in here you're going to find lots of, um, this is still going to be a area where you might find squirrels, chipmunks, um, owls actually love areas like this. They love uh, nice trees that they can perch on, like the bay laurel that is arching over the understory. And of course, they're totally into areas that are going to have tons of squirrels and all that, right? So good. I actually did find an owl pellet earlier today and pulled it apart and found, uh, you know, a skull of a mouse, uh, you know, lower jaw and all these things. Pretty cool to explore, yeah. So, let's continue on. So this is our oak woodland. Um, still kind of mixed conifer forest. You know, sometimes there isn't a good answer as to um, what community you're in, except for like, you know, oak woodlands can often be confused with mixed conifer forest. Um, but again, if you're wondering what community you're in, good to look at the ground and you can see what all you have around you now here I see tons of bay laurel still have um, some pine 
get that in the camera. Those are from pine trees. I'm getting a lot more uh, rock as well. Um, being that this is kind of the basin of a floodplain where we might see a lot of movement of water pushing rocks down a slope and collecting in that basin, right? All conditional. Um, you're getting a little bit more sun than you would in, say, a redwood forest and not as much sun. This is a great place to take a break from that uh, prairie or grassland that we went through. Now, some people are getting very confused between prairies and meadows or grasslands, right? Prairies are pretty much all grasses and meadows. Well, you're going to find some uh, deciduous trees, some trees that like to be in the wide open, right? Cool stuff. All right. So next we're going to be moving down again we're now in the oak woodland kind of borderlining the uh mixed conifer forest um we're getting a little bit more variety on our understory plants we still have modesty um we have poison oak down there we do get some pretty neat uh wildflowers in this area two-eyed violet um, but as we start moving in, we start seeing some ferns because guess what? We're moving closer and closer into our um, redwood forest, right? So check this out. This is important, right? So, so far we've been seeing Douglas fir, we've seen bay laurel, live oak, tan oak. Um, we've seen a couple redwoods, but um, not a whole lot. But I'm going to be moving downhill, uh, down that watershed again. And as I move, this is a slope. We see Douglas fir right in front of me. But beyond that, once we move down this slope, we're going to get into the floodplain. And the floodplain is the perfect condition for coast redwoods to grow. And moving down this hill. Sorry, I'm trying to get this. This is all mirrored camera action. Okay. Moving down this steep slope. Now, water would flow down here in the event of rain and settle in this flat area at the base. All right. And as we're moving down, we start to see a little bit richer uh, looking understory plants. We still have our. Uh, tan oak, we still have our um, uh, California Bay Laurel. Um, we're starting to see some lady fern and wood fern. Um, we have now, sorry about the camera here, um, trail marker plant over there. And we're getting down into that floodplain, the basin at the base of the Blood plane, right? Okay. Now, we just traveled through a mixed conifer forest and traveled down into uh, our flood plane. And all around me, this is not, you know, this is not the best stand of redwoods, but um, we do start to see redwoods around us. The plants have entirely changed. Now we're seeing all those typical redwood plants. We have redwood store. Okay. No good. <laughs> Thanks for going on that ride with me. Um, all right. Let me set up my tripod in a steady location. That's laughable. Okay. Here we go. So, <laughs> um, right, let's tilt you down. <laughs> well, all right, there we go. You gotta make sure your tripod's steady. Yeah, I'm glad you're there for that, Lydia. Sometimes you drop your tripod. Um, <laughs> so now we got a um, uh, mixture of all sorts of redwood plants. Um, the uh, yep, poison oak, you have redwood sorrel, 
you got um, our trail marker plants. Um, and most of all, it's still a little cockeyed from my uh, fall there. I didn't fall down. My camera did. <laughs> uh, embarrassing. <laughs> well, just goes to show you sometimes you have difficulty uh, doing your job. <laughs> All right, but yes, most of all, we have our coast redwoods. These beautiful things. And the thing about these coast redwoods is that they absolutely love floodplains. They need tons and tons of water in order to grow. Some of them, some of our larger redwoods require about, uh, require about, uh, well, 500 up to 500 gallons of water a day. Getting it both from it being in a basin, like the floodplain, as well getting it from the uh, canopy during the summer. When it's not raining, the warm inland temperatures are drawing in coastal fog. And those upper needles uh, are capturing that uh, water as it passes through. Cool. All right, well... We're going to continue on to our final habitat, and um, I'm going to try not to drop you this time. Sit. Bear with me here. i got to tighten this up. I know. It's pretty interesting. Uh, okay, I'm going to take you in the handheld version here now, because I don't want to um, risk another tumble like that. Luckily, I did that in a very soft uh soil composition redwood duff is the softest thing you can fall into so i'm gonna go ahead and drop off my tripod here set that down welcome back to work steve all right um <laughs> so we do have this redwood forest all drinking up the water as it flows down but even further down the flood plain, right, as the flood um, water will drain and find the easiest pathway into our creeks and rivers. So we're going to be moving through kind of a wetland, um, another ecotome, but we're going to see a difference of plants in the composition here. All right, let's see. So we see some mixture of plants still getting some blackberry coarse poison oak because it's everywhere um, you just got to be careful when you're hiking then we move through and oh this is something you would expect to see in a wetland right we have horsetail equisetum um, this is a plant that loves to be on the edge of full wetland and we're moving down this slope. We have, these are in the carrot family. These are the umbels. Um, let's see, what is it? Might be watercress, uh, could be, not poison hemlock. Um, could be watercress. Uh, anyways, um, a lot of these plants are toxic to eat, um, but this is also the carrot family. So some of the roots might actually be edible. All right, moving down, we got this big slope to go down. And this is why I didn't want the tripod with me, especially after that number earlier. More horsetail. And above, we're starting to see some, well, these are um, Oregon ash trees all around. And then we move through, and one of our signifying plants of the next ecosystem is alder because we are going through what we call a riparian zone. Riparian zones are totally diff different as far as the conditions that make them because they are going to be plants that can deal with fluctuations in um, water levels, right? Because this is an area that is sometimes underwater. 
In fact, a lot of our river here is kind of drying up. We see this uh, remnants of the uh, Navarro River at this moment is uh, covered with mosquito fern and a lot of scuzzy algae, which is important as habitat for a lot of different animals, um, frogs and uh, mosquitoes. Um, they love stagnant water um, that protect them from lots of animals. So I'm standing on the banks of the Navarro River. I'm trying to see where, okay, get some good river access. But we see a lot of these plants that are around now are plants that kind of depend on the flow of water to spread their seed from place to place. Say for instance, the willow. Willow loves to stump or well, sprout from little twigs that might break off at one point uh, along the river. And those twigs will go and jam themselves into some soil or some uh, uh, rocks and dirt. And from there, the buds will root into the ground and it will train and make a new willow in its place. All right, now we're getting close. So it's been a uh, kind of hot year um, and we haven't received a whole lot of rain in the last couple months. So our river is very sad. Let me tell you, some winters, this uh, river will be bank to bank um, and flowing. But as far as riparian zones go, you get tons of animals dependent on the availability of water. That's where you get amphibians, um, you know, turtles. We get turtles around here. I hope I see a turtle. We uh, luckily have uh, the Western Pond Turtle, which is a native turtle in the area. We also get tons of uh, birds that are actually feeding off of a lot of the river critters, a lot of different, um, a lot of different nymphs and things that you might find in these algae. Now you might also see a lot of fr fish fry there, um, a lot of perch, um, not a lot of salmonoids though it would be it has historically been a good river for salmon um, you know we've seen a decline in the salmon because this valley is very much ag land and all up the river there is a whole bunch of farms and wineries and a lot of them have permits uh, to or grandfathered permits in order to draw from the river so a lot of the time we don't have a whole lot of river that lasts uh, into the year. But unfortunately, as we see here, this is actually, what I'm looking at right here, this is actually a car frame or a trailer frame that has flowed down a river a long time ago. And it's really sad to see, but goes to show you that you really should be careful about um, your waste and what might find its way into the river streams. Um, because this all is flowing out um, towards the ocean, right? Of course, we have a big block, uh, a tree came down over this uh, last year and uh, it's kind of blocking off this cor corner. But then again, we got all this uh, mosquito fern creating tons of habitat for fish um, for uh, yeah for spawning fish for spawning uh, different flies and nymphs uh, dragonfly larva caddisfly larva all going through and very important to the ecosystem because it just feeds all these amazing birds so anyways that's a whole lot of information there um as well as a little bit of comedy so uh, remember, we were talking about um, plant communities and plant communities are dependent on very much the conditions that they uh, create. Both the soil composition, um, the surrounding organisms that are uh, around, the availability of sun, 
the availability of water, um, all very important in building a plant community. And to think that the plant communities are not somehow related is just naive. All these plant communities actually feed off of one each other, one another, right? If it weren't for the oak woodlands, then you wouldn't have uh, enough squirrels. And if you didn't have enough squirrels, you wouldn't have enough owls. If you didn't have, you know, it trickles down. So every plant community has a, you know, a role to play in the bigger picture. So anyways, I think I've rambled on long enough. Um, thank you all for joining me today on this exploration through multiple plant communities. If you didn't catch it uh, from the beginning, then um, you can uh, start it over. If you want to really rewatch the part where I dropped my camera, um, you can uh, you know, go back. I think it was about 15 minutes in. Um, as well, uh, from uh, California State Parks, uh, Sonoma Mendocino Coast District, I'm Steven Yehelka and uh, hope to see you soon. Um, by the way, if you're going out hiking and all that stuff, remember to bring your face mask with you. Wear it when, uh, when necessary. Um, keep your six foot distance, uh, physical distance of six feet. Wash your hands regularly. Um, don't, um, don't group up in uh, large groups. And stay safe out there. All right. Um, I hope you all have a beautiful summer.